going to be a lecture, the title of which, let me just get it right, is Psychiatric Diagnosis, the First Cause of Everything Bad in the Mental Health System. Uh, and so Paula is a, uh, is a research and clinical psychologist, has, uh, is an associate here at the Hutchins Center for African and African American Research, uh, has had an affiliation in the past with the Women in Public Policy Program here mm -hmm. at the Kennedy School, is a, a dear friend of mine, is an award-winning author and scholar and activist, and is also a playwright and a filmmaker we just screened at the Carr Center on uh, on, on, uh, on, on Tuesday, uh, a, a film, a documentary film, a new one that's now circulating in the film festivals or is, is, is making its way around, <laughs> called Isaac Pope, The Spirit of an American Century. Uh, and Paula is someone who wears many hats and contains multitudes, and I'm sure this is going to be both a creative and uh, insightful and also provocative talk. So without further ado, uh, let me welcome Paula Kaplan. Thank you. Uh, and uh, Tim McCarthy is heroic. Um, if you don't know about him, you've got to Google him, become his Facebook friend. Uh, he speaks up courageously, utterly fearlessly. Well, he may be afraid, but he doesn't let that stop him. Um, and so he's, he's made so many friends. He has so many people who adore him and are grateful to him, including me. And he has many people who want him to be quiet. And so thank you for yes. everything you do. And I also want to thank um, Jana Lynn Brown yes. for, for having helped make this happen. She's in the car center. And um, so is it, are we rolling now? Yeah. yeah. Okay, okay, good. Yes, okay, all right, good. Um, so I, I have a whole lot I want to say. Um, and what I'm going to do um, is, is say some introductory things and I'm going to be uh, interweaving this with several monologues from a play I wrote about this topic which is called, the play is called Call Me Crazy. Um, I describe it as a comedy drama with music. Um, it's about psychiatric diagnosis and as far, as far as I know, this is the first time that anyone at Harvard has ever talked, given a talk about um, questioning psychiatric diagnosis. So, um, you know, and, and good methodology. Um, and, and so there's nothing I ever say that I can't back up with the evidence. Um, so I thought that was really interesting. And, and, th and then they soon kicked me off as a blogger. That's something I want to write about soon. Um, and they allow people to keep blogging who do make claims that have no evidence to back them up and that are very harmful to people. So this is called um, psychiatric diagnosis, the first cause of everything bad in the mental health system. And I want to start by um, doing um, one of the monologues. Uh, in the play Call Me Crazy, there are four people, two women and two men, who, uh, who are um, therapists of, from various disciplines and various ages, and there are four quote-unquote mental patients, two women and two men, and they're in hospital gowns. And they are watching these therapists have their case conferences and talk about them, um, and they are, ready for the symbolism, they are unseen by and unheard by the therapist. And so they're watching what the therapists do, and every once in a while when the therapists do something they just can't bear to be quiet about anymore, they rush out and they do a show. And, and it's very sophomoric kinds of humor. There's a, there's a psychiatrist marching band. Um, there's uh, 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 there's, there's a, 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 the a gay and lesbian uh, hallelujah chorus when the psychiatrists are deciding to depathologize homosexuality by a vote, which is what they did. Um, anyway, and, um, and then each of the, of the mental patients uh, has a monologue. So, and this is, this is what patient one says. I was a child of disco. I felt free and strong. I went on the pill and slept with anyone I wanted. The pains came. Sharp, stabbing, jackknifing pains. I got them nearly every month, and they lasted a week until my period started. A voice inside me said, you slept around. Did you really think you'd get away without paying for that? I went to my gynecologist. He examined me internally and said nothing was wrong. I asked him, how can nothing be wrong when I'm in excruciating pain? 
And then he asked me, as though this was an answer to my question, are you under a lot of stress? Are you a worrier? Only about these goddamn pains, I replied. He told me to breathe deeply when the pains hit, and then he ushered me out of his office. For the next three weeks, I breathed so deeply, I got dizzy. I watched a lot of comedies, ate all the Hershey kisses I wanted. If you'd thought I was relaxed and happy before, you should have seen me that month. And then the pains hit again, just as hard as ever. I went back to the kind of gynecologist. I'd had an idea. Could I have some kind of infection, I mean, inside? He ran some tests and told me, nothing physical is wrong with you, dear. He sent me to a psychiatrist who told me I had premenstrual mental disorder and put me on antidepressants. I got more depressed on the pills, and every month the pains came back. Six weeks ago, my gynecologist operated on me for a cyst. When he opened me up, he found masses of infection and scar tissue, old scar tissue from infection years before. Way back when I'd asked him to check me for infections, he'd only checked for a couple, not the one that I had that caused the pains. He removed some of the scar tissue, but couldn't get a lot of it. Now I can never have a child. Now that's a real story. It happened to someone I knew very well. Not to me, but to somebody else. Um, okay, so, and I should tell you, um, I was living in California for some years, and um, uh, my cousin, Eden Bernardi, is the be was the best acting teacher in the world. Um, she died a couple of years ago, and, and she knew about all this. She heard me talk endlessly about it, and she knew the play, and she said, would you come and talk to my acting students, because um, they've all been diagnosed with something, and a lot of them are on medication, and, uh, and she said, and then they get sent out on auditions, and they're told, okay, so you're auditioning for David, he's bipolar, or Mary, she's borderline. I can sit. Um, and, uh, and so I thought, you know, I could lecture endlessly, and because so many of them are diagnosed and medicated, they're going to be resisting and resisting, and so they're actors. So I printed out their six monologues in, in the play, and I printed the six monologues out, and I just handed them out randomly, and I didn't give them any time even to read through what they were going to do. Just, we just did cold readings of the six monologues, and that did it. You know, they knew, they felt what it's like to go through this kind of devastation. Um, now, diagnosis, psychiatric diagnosis has in some ways replaced God in being invoked as an explanation for everything. So even playwrights, novelists will say, this person has generalized anxiety disorder. Instead of using words that tell you something, if, it's, if you're talking about anxiety, it's usually fear. Fear of what? If you're talking about major depressive disorder, that is used to explain almost everything except feeling happy. So it can be loneliness, it can be helplessness, it can be despondency, it can be a whole range of negative things, but it all gets given the same uh, label. Um, I had been an advocate of psychiatric diagnosis. I was born and raised in Springfield, Missouri, and I believed that authorities were our friends. I was a very well-behaved girl. Then I came to Radcliffe as an undergraduate, and I was still a very well-behaved girl and very apolitical until some brave members of my class of 69 um, occupied University Hall for all sorts of good reasons and then were beaten by the police who were brought in. And when I saw the blood on their faces and finally listened to what they were talking about, um, that was what got me much more politically involved. Um, and but despite that, when I became a psychologist, the, the psychiatric manual that, do you all know what the DSM is? Does anybody not know what it is? Everybody knows? Okay, I don't know. Anybody not know? Okay, so the, the, it's called the Psychiatrist Bible, right? It has hundreds and hundreds of categories and subcategories of alleged mental illnesses, and each one has a multi-digit number 
with a decimal point. So the implication, and it's called Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, which makes it sound so scientific. And then you open it up, and, it, and there it is implying that if you have 232.14, that means that in some scientifically proven way, you are different from a 232.15. That's a total myth, and I'll come back to that in a minute. But it looks very scientific, and it will say, to give the, a person this label, they have to meet six of these eight criteria. And to give them this label, they have to meet five of the nine criteria. Again, it looks has this aura of scientific precision that's very compelling. When I used to do clinical work, I'd have people come to me and say, now, I, I don't meet quite all these criteria, but I can't find out what I really am because I don't exactly need any of these. So it's had a lot of power. All the talk shows will have people on. They say they have this diagnosis. And poor Catherine, Catherine Zeta-Jones, you know, she, she announced proudly she was bipolar and she was going to be brave and say it publicly because she wanted to help other people. Well, you know what happened to her that year? Her stepson was imprisoned for drug dealing and her husband, Michael Douglas, was diagnosed with throat cancer and they thought he might die. All right, now you're a famous actor, Catherine Zeta-Jones, and you're terrified, you're sad, you're, you're, you're feeling horrible, but you have to go film or you have to make a public appearance. So you get your energy up and you smile. Well, bipolar disorder, there it is. Sometimes she's down, sometimes she's up. Clearly a mental illness and let's get her on the drugs, which do horrible damage to more people than they help. Not just don't leave here saying that I said nobody should ever take one of these pills, but they should be fully informed. I'm, I don't want to get off totally on medication uh, though right now. So, um, so I was an advocate. I was at the University of Toronto. I was teaching uh, people who were going to be clinicians and, um, and I would hold up the, the DSM and I would say this is really wonderful because I believe they're advertising. The American Psychiatric Association publishes it and I would hold it up and say that people have culled through all of the research about human emotions and human behavior and they have put together what we know as a species about human suffering and here it is and they had decision trees in the back I love logic it makes me salivate you know and I look at this isn't it wonderful and then I wrote a book called the myth of women's masochism because I was tired of hearing that if a woman is being beaten or mis mistreated by her partner then it must be because she enjoys it and on and on and the, right before the book came out I got a call from Jean, the late, now Jean Baker Miller, um, who had put together a group of women to protest some new proposed categories that they wanted to add to what was then going to be the next edition of the DSM. And that was going to be DSM third revised edition. And I, I, went, uh, I went to this meeting that was of these women, including the wonderful Lenore Walker and, um, and Judith Herman, who's written so beautifully about trauma, and, and um, Teresa Bernardes. And we sat there with some of the DSM head honchos. And because of the way I was raised, you know, not ever to be afraid to ask questions or turn out to be wrong, I thought, these people are, this is who I studied in graduate school, these are the experts. And so, I'll say my little piece that I've been asked to present, and, and then, um, then they will tell me what I, what I missed. They will educate me, and so it'll be a learning experience. I could not believe what happened in that meeting, um, and I'll tell you just really briefly, because I got so much else to say. Um, I, I was talking about the myth of women's masochism because they were proposing to put masochistic personality disorder in the DSM. And I said, you know, the concept of masochism doesn't make any sense. It's defined as pleasure in pain. That's like saying this is the blackness of whiteness. It, it doesn't make any sense. And if you read about people who are described as masochists or say they're masochists, it's, it's not enjoyment of the suffering or even the physical pain. 
it's always something else. And I won't go into all the other things. There's, I wrote the whole book about it. But, um, you know, including, including, um, I don't feel I will ever be able to get anything better than the situation that I'm in. Or he's threatened to kill the kids in me if I leave him. So I don't dare, you know, all, all sorts of things like that. So um, anyway, I, I, because I was at this meeting, um, I said my piece and, uh, and I, I waited for, you know, <laughs> to be educated. And Robert Spitzer, who was head of the DSM-3R, said to me, I saw you on Donahue. Phil Donahue had, you know, the, what was then the pre-Oprah, the biggest talk show in the country, and I'd just been on it the day before. And he said, I agree with just about everything you said. And I said about this, um, and I thought, well, how embarrassing that I tried to present some substance, and he's going, I saw you on Donahue, and so I didn't want to embarrass him. And I, I said, well, if you agreed with everything I said, I'm not sure why you would continue to propose masochistic personality <coughs> disorder. And he and the other committee members said, because we see people like this all the time. I said, no, you think you're seeing people like this, but what you're seeing are people who are stuck in a difficult situation or don't have the resources to get out or don't have the self-confidence to get out or you know, a whole lot of other things. Well, when I heard the way they talked about whether or not to put this in the next edition, I thought, you know, I had assumed this was science. There's no science going on here. And then you'll love this. They said um, after we did our presentations and they commented, uh, the head of their committee said, well, gentlemen, he said to, and there was a woman on their committee, well, gentlemen, shall we adjourn to, dare I call it, the Freud room to make our decisions? They actually went down the hall to the Freud room and, you know, and then they came back and they weren't going to change anything that they were doing. Um, and one of the things I had pointed out was, your, your description of masochistic personality includes um, settling for less when you could have more, thinking of others before yourself. This is well-socialized feminine behavior. And if women don't act that way, they get rejected, they don't get dates, they get called unfeminine and unnatural. But now you're saying, and if they do act that way, they're mentally ill. This is an impossible catch-22. Anyway, through that, I ended up um, starting a petition campaign against that and, and another category, premenstrual dysphoric disorder. Um, and we got more than six million people represented on petitions and letters and so on. And um, I'm going to jump over a whole lot of stuff. A lot, a lot of what I'm saying right now is, is in my book, They Say You're Crazy. Um, and um, what ended up happening was they, f they publish one edition and then they start to work on the next one because what has to happen? Everybody who needs to give diagnoses has to get rid of the old book and buy the new one. Um, the, the next edition, the DSM-4, um, was in force um, for, I forget how many years, uh, maybe 15 years, and, um, and it it earned more than $100 million for the American Psychiatric Association. Not one penny did they spend on helping anybody who was suffering or on helping anybody who had been harmed by the use of these diagnostic labels. So this is big business. Anyway, I called Alan Francis. He was going to be the head of the DSM-4 task force. And I called him to say, my graduate students and I are going to be reviewing research as it comes out and, and maybe we could work cooperatively because that's always my first impulse. And he said, well, I have a better idea. Why don't you join two of our committees as a consultant? The premenstrual dysphoric disorder one, which is women go crazy once a month, not you have cramps and breast tenderness and stuff. And, um, and the, it had been renamed from masochistic to self-defeating personality disorder. Big deal, no change, right? And I said, well, okay. He said, because this time, and I used to be a journalist. I wrote all this down while we were on the phone, and it's in the book. He said two things. This time, we are going to make decisions based on the science. And this time, we're going to have open and honest debate. So implicit in the this times, was that hadn't happened before, and he was right. 
And I thought, well, I don't know this guy, Alan Francis, but I'd love to be a part of something like that. So I accepted, and I said, but I think I should say that if I am not comfortable with what happens, I will resign, and I'll feel free to speak publicly about it. And I remember he said, and I wrote down, I'm sure you will. And that's what happened. After two years on those committees, and seeing how they, when there's good science, they ignore it, distort it, or lie about it. And I've had lawyers check this. I can say lie, because uh, they do. It's, it's all documented. When there's junk science, they will pretend that that supports whatever they want to do anyway. Um, so I resigned after two years of trying to get them to be honest and trying to get them to care about the harm they were causing. Because after I, I started this petition campaign, um, I started hearing stories from so many people whose lives had been destroyed in a huge array of ways. So psychiatric, so I, so I resigned. Um, psychiatric diagnosis um, is the first cause of everything bad in the mental health system because if they don't diagnose you, they're not supposed to do anything to you, but once they give you any one of the hundreds of labels in that book, they can do just about anything to you and call it treatment. I was an expert witness in a case in which a wonderful woman, a thriving with a thriving professional career, smart as could be, um, her life was just about ruined emotionally by these three therapists. There was a jury trial and they found, they, they uh, exonerated all three of the therapists because they said, well, they were just following the standard of care. And they were, but the standard of care, when the standard of care is horrible, then, you know, they used to say tuberculosis was psychological and ulcers were from stress rather than from the bacterium they found that caused ulcers and so on. So when the standard of care is just wrong, how can we be letting people get away with destroying people's lives? Um, so the other thing you need to know is that psychiatric diagnosis is completely unregulated in this country and as far as I know, everywhere. Certainly in Canada, it's true. Um, and what that means is you don't have any recourse if this product, the DSM, has led to damage to your, to your life. Um, and I'll, I'll come back to that a little bit later, what we tried to do about that. So, um, okay, let me, let me tell you now the, uh, the three major myths about psychiatric diagnosis. These are myths. Number one, that it's scientific. Number two, that getting a label will reduce your suffering. That one's a little more complicated, and I'll expand on that. And number three, the myth that um, getting a psychiatric label does not expose you to any kinds of risks of harm. So these could not be further from the truth. About uh, the uh, being scientific, um, Alan Francis, the head of DSM-4 Task Force, who has been called still the most important psychiatrist in the world because he was head of the DSM-4 that was in force for so many years until just about five or six years ago. Um, he was quoted in an article in Wired online by Gary Greenberg, um, who had followed him around and written sort of adoringly about him. Uh, but, but one night Alan said to, to Gary Greenberg, you know, psychiatric diagnosis is bullshit. Gary Greenberg quoted it in the article and in his book, The Book of Woe, which is a wonderful book about <laughs> diagnosis, um, he says how Alan Francis went berserk uh, to, because he did that. He said, don't you know the other side is going to use that against us? And I have to tell you, Gary Greenberg sent me his book. He said, look on page such and such, and I did. And it turns out Alan Francis wrote to him and, and I guess insulted him in the most horrific way he could think of. He said, what are you, Paula Kaplan in drag? So, um, but the other thing you need to know about, about Alan Francis and what he says about psychiatric diagnosis being or not being a science 
is that except for when he was quoted there, he maintains, and he has said this publicly many times, these are his words, that when he created the DSM-4, the process was scrupulously scientific. Now how can it all be bullshit, and yet his process was scrupulously scientific? And I, I'm the only person who's ever been an insider on a DSM task force, and then written about what goes on there. I saw how completely unscientific it was. Um, about the second myth, that uh, the claim that it, getting a label will reduce your suffering, there are two ways in which it can do that. One is people will say, I, I'm just a mess, I don't know what's wrong. And then the therapist will say, oh, you have generalized anxiety disorder. And then the patient will often feel relieved right then. Oh my God, that's what it is. It's got a name. That's helpful to me. And presumably you've seen this kind of thing before, so presumably you know how to fix it. So there can be this immediate sense of relief. Now, I have a dear colleague with whom I have this kind of discussion all the time about this, and I say, you know what? If He says, see, so it is helpful. And I say, well, what if instead of disorder, you had just said you are extremely anxious or fearful, even better, more specific. Let's talk about what you're afraid of, what can be done about that. Do you think that would have helped her any less? In fact, it would have helped her more because what you're doing, uh, producing the immediate relief of, ah, oh, it's a thing and I'm going to get help for it, I'll be better, is at the same time you're saying, you're mentally ill, right? So it's like it's almost like a, a bribe. And I'm not saying all therapists are bad. Some are wonderful and very helpful. But, but many of them are not aware of that this is the trade-off here. Um, so you're adding to the burden. Oh, I, it's generalized anxiety disorder. So I should be handling whatever it is that's scaring me better or else I wouldn't be disordered. Um, veterans, uh, military people come back from war and they're traumatized and what, what do they get told? You have post-traumatic stress disorder. Not you have war trauma, which we can all understand, but because war upset you, you're mentally ill. PTSD is an official psychiatric diagnosis from the DSM. The other way that getting a label can reduce suffering, at least temporarily, is you get to see a therapist and it's, your insurance pays for it. So it helps you in that way, it helps the therapist. Now, the problem with that is that it goes on your record. I can't tell you how often I am getting emails from people saying that for this reason or this reason or this reason, I mean, you can't imagine all the situations in which having a label hurts you and they're saying, I want to get this taken off my record. How can I do that? You know what? It's damned hard. I have some suggestions. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. So everything from, there's a military woman, and her, I mean, she's a military wife. Her husband is, is being sent to a position overseas. She's not allowed to go with him because she has the psychiatric diagnosis. And if you heard about how she happened to get that label, you'd say she never should have been called mentally ill. She was suffering. People suffer. And they suffer in a wide variety of ways. That's totally different from saying, and they are mentally ill and I'm not. You know, it creates a, really, a, a real us and them. That they are somehow qualitatively different. And of course, what the drug companies want us to believe is that their brains are different their brain chemistry is different and that Prozac as the commercials say may help may fix your brain chemistry it's the may that protects them from lawsuits to, to a great degree um, but now what is the cost of getting this label if good it identifies I have something but that's a myth you don't have a thing that's been scientifically derived, constructed, supported. You're scared, you know, or you're devastated, or you're sad, you're grieving, whatever it is. Um, and, um, and so that part, that part isn't, isn't real grounds for relief. 
Um, and then about the insurance, well, we'll come back to that later on. Um, but, but the insurance is not going to pay for non-pathologizing things that will help you. In 2011, the Ash Center here at Harvard Kennedy School, um, uh, we, we allowed me to organize a conference for veterans and their loved ones, and it was called a Better Welcome Home. And we have on a website um, more than two dozen 10-minute videos of people from all over the country, from the DOD, from the VA, from private lives, um, saying, each saying, here's how I help veterans and or their loved ones without labeling them and with low risk or no risk approaches, physical exercise, mindfulness and meditation, having a service animal, involvement in the arts, involvement in education, in political action, in community service. I have a project where we just have a non-veteran just listen to a vet privately. Phenomenal the consequences huge array of phenomenal consequences. But insurance doesn't pay for those things almost ever. And so when you say, oh, I want to get a label so my insurance will pay for me to get help, well, how long was Woody Allen in therapy? What did it do for him? And of course, he paid out of his pocket, I'm sure. But, but um, the fact that you go see a therapist may not be what's going to be helpful to you. And since the, the trade-off is you have to agree to accept one or more labels um, that introduces risks of various kinds. Um, so, so part of the problem with this, you can, if you get a label, your insurance will cover it, is, well, but then the, the view of what kinds of things will be offered to you that could be helpful is narrowed. And I've written in a number of places that any professional who is, or friend, who's recommending anything to help somebody feel better, there are two criteria they should always meet, and they almost never are met. And the first one is this. Say, uh, you know, this person comes to see me, I'm the therapist, I say, I'm recommending X for you. Well, the first criterion I should meet is, I have to tell you everything I was able to find out about the positive and negative effects of X. I also have to tell you, if it's a psychiatric drug, I need to tell you that lawsuits have exposed the fact that pharmaceutical companies regularly conceal or minimize the worst of the dangers so that even though I tried hard to find out all of the risks involved in what I'm recommending, I know I probably can't. And then criterion <coughs> two is I'm recommending X for you, but I'm also going to tell you about the whole array of kinds of approaches that people who've been experiencing what you're experiencing have found helpful, at least some of them. So people always say, okay, okay, so, so fine, fine for people who are feeling sad or scared or grieving or whatever, but what about the schizophrenics and the bipolars and, you know, all the scare words, the, the things that everybody assumes those constructs are real and that they're terrifying and that the only thing that's going to help is locking them up or medicating them. Okay, what research has shown is that regardless of label, even these scary ones, you know what helps people the most? Getting them a safe place to live helping them find meaning in their lives, whether it's a paid job or volunteer work, those are the kinds, having friends, having people who are caring and supportive. And this is across all of those hundreds of diagnostic categories. No surprise, because there's no science behind those anyway. Um, for the third myth, oh, by the way, there's a website um, that I started, and I never have the time to fix it up very much, but it's called Psych Diagnosis, P-S-Y-C-H Diagnosis, as one word, dot Weebly, W-E-E-B-L-Y, dot com. And on there, um, there are, there's a lot of information about what you reading about this, and also uh, we have some very brief videos made by some people whose lives were destroyed in a variety of ways by getting a label. And um, some of them could not go public, and so we had actors read them. Uh, and one woman just had the picture of her brother who died 
from all of this um, up while, while you hear her voice. Now the third myth, the vast, there's a vast array of kinds of harm that can result from diagnosis and it ranges from about the mildest is plummeting self-confidence. You know, there's something wrong with me. Not my sergeant raped me, not I lost my mother, um, but, and so of course I'm upset, uh, but, and there's something wrong with me. Six weeks after my father died, people who really loved me, close friends, were, were alarmed that I was still desperately grief-stricken. I adored my father, he was wonderful. And they said, don't you think that you should go see someone and get a little something to take the edge off? And I thought, what? Why? I mean, this is what you go through when something like that happens to you. And take the edge off, what does that mean? Well, with these drugs, it will suppress the, the, the experiencing of the grief and that means that if you ever go off the pills, you have to go through the rest of the grieving process anyway. And it suppresses a whole lot of other stuff. Anyway, um, so, so the, the harm from psychiatric labels ranges at one end from plummeting self-confidence to loss of employment. My daughter is, uh, is an attorney. She does employment discrimination law. And, you know, it's illegal in this country to discriminate in employment because of somebody having a, a label of mental illness. Uh, but there are two things you should know about that. One is that um, uh, they, don't, they don't usually say, well, we fired her because she has a mental illness. They say she wasn't a team player. Mm -hmm. She didn't hold up her end of the, you know, the work and so on. Um, the other thing that I learned from my daughter is that uh, you don't, if you want a reasonable accommodation made because you are fearful or you're, um, you don't work well when there are lots of other people around or, or whatever it is, whatever the emotional or behavioral problem is, you don't have to get a psychiatric diagnosis. You can have a professional say she has a hard time when the room is very noisy or she doesn't want to be in the same, in the same workplace as the guy who sexually assaulted her. You know, you can have a description of what, what is the reason in ordinary words and what are the, um, what's the term, the, the, the life, the, what is it, um, the life functions, you know, daily functions of life that you have trouble with and therefore are requesting a reasonable accommodation for. And that's really important for people to know. So from a psychiatric label, you can lose custody of child. Um, I've worked a lot with women veterans who either were uh, sexually assaulted and that upset them or they were mothers and they're deployed and they're missing their kids and they're feeling they're, uh, like a bad mom. So they go to see the military therapist who of course gives them a label. And then some of them get uh, kicked out of the military, d dishonorable discharge on this basis or medical discharge if they're lucky. And then they go home and they often lose custody of their children because they are mentally ill. Um, you can lose every one of your human rights. You can lose the right to make decisions about your medical and legal affairs. Um, and, and then the, the ultimate kind of harm is death from the um, cumulative effect of a lot of these drugs. There is a lot of research showing that the drugs that are usually given to people diagnosed with bipolar disorder or with schizophrenia um, and increasingly given to veterans and other people so they can sleep better actually shorten the lifespan by 25 to 30 years. And people on the other side of these arguments say, oh, well, they probably just didn't take care of themselves because they were mentally ill. No, there's documentation of the physical harm. You start on one of these drugs and you get diabetes. Even before you gain the 60 pounds that many people gain in the first few months after going on a lot of these drugs, you get heart problems, all, all sorts of physical harm. Um, uh, there's a, a, a researcher in, uh, at the University of Toronto, Philip Seaman, who found literal shrinkage of the brain from these drugs. So even to death um, can, can be uh, the kind, some of the kinds of harm. Um, 
Now, uh, why does it matter? This is a question for you all. Bless you. Why does it matter that there's no science behind any of this? Because you, you know the rationale for having these categories is, well, it, it helps us know how to treat patients, right? If their leg is broken, you put a cast on the leg. Why, why is it a problem that it's not scientific? Anyone? Well, imagine you're suffering in some way or other. You go to see a therapist, and they say you have borderline personality disorder, and therefore you need to do A, B, and C. You don't even know what to ask if you don't know that there's no science behind it. You go, oh, they're the authority, and they know how to make me feel better. Aren't I lucky? So you don't even know what questions to ask. Um, let me read another one of the monologues from Call Me Crazy. This one is um, a, a, a quite old man, and um, the first time we did the play, my father did it. Um, he was a great actor. So this is it. I've been in the nursing home for two years now. Can't rely on my body to work the way it used to. Lots of pains, sometimes pretty bad ones. Hardly ever get any visitors. When I first got here, they came a bit more often, but not much now. I think they feel uncomfortable. They want to cheer me up, but they see where I'm staying and they can guess what it's like when they leave. I got to feeling pretty down. The nurses asked me, Max, how do you feel? I asked, how do you think I feel? How would you feel? I was an accountant for 50 years and a damn good one. I've always been more comfortable talking about numbers and about things than about feelings. They called in a psychiatrist and he asked a bunch of ridiculous questions. Max, what day of the week is it? Max, how old are you? Then get this, he said, can you count backwards by sevens from 100? I said, that's a damn foolish question. Ask me a decent one and you'll get an answer. He wrote in my chart that I had a mental illness called paranoid personality disorder. He also wrote that I was depressed. Ordered electric shock treatments to get rid of the depression. The head of the nursing home brought me a form to sign giving permission for the shock. I refused. She called the psychiatrist back in and he said that by refusing the electroshock, I showed that I was out of touch with reality. I didn't know what was good for me. If you're declared incompetent, they can make you have electroshock and other things against your will. I chose dignity over blind obedience and for that they decided I didn't know how to look after my own interests. Almost all my savings are gone, paid to the nursing home. I've applied for legal aid trying to get a lawyer to fight this thing. But I don't know what will happen. That is also a true case. Um, that one was actually what happened to a woman, and she somehow, uh, she had the money to get a lawyer, and she somehow connected with Lily Tomlin, who went to bat for her, and so she didn't get shocked. But how many people have the money, the resources to do that. And of course, part of the problem is when you get a diagnosis, it's because you're suffering. You're often debilitated. Your, your energy is sapped. You often don't have money. And so you are the least likely to be in a position to fight against um, what's being done to you. Um, well, we, we wanted to file complaints. I've been, I've been trying since 1995, when my book came out, the They Say You're Crazy came out, um, to find a lawyer who will file a test case. And actually, a brilliant friend of mine named Wendy Murphy, who's a lawyer in town, um, uh, she, uh, she was advising me about this. Well, I couldn't find a lawyer except, guess what? somebody who was a Scientologist, and I said, oh, no. I read his brief. I thought, oh, God, this is exactly what I've been wanting. And I couldn't, I just couldn't bring myself to work with him because 
They're so dangerous. And anyway, and they prey on people who have been diagnosed as mentally ill because, you know, oh, and the psychiatrist mistreated you, but we understand you. Come to us. And then they take your money and they take away your freedom and so on. But anyway, um, uh, what, uh, finally, what, what um, a lawyer in Alaska named Jim Gottstein, who's a tireless um, advocate for people's rights in the, in the psychiatric and, and psychological systems, he said, I, since you can't find a lawyer to do this, he said, I think the way to go is to file com ethics complaints against the American Psychiatric Association. So I put out a call for anybody harmed by psychiatric diagnosis, get in touch if you want to file a complaint. Only women came forward. I don't know why. I didn't pre-select. Um, I think, you know, we know that there's sexism, misogyny in the mental health system, so women are more likely to have suffered, but lots of men have too. And also women, they, they were, these women were just brave. <laughs> and so um, I organized the filing of nine complaints with the ethics department of the American Psychiatric Association. And in each one, and, and seven of those people had themselves been harmed in a huge variety of ways. The eighth one was the woman whose brother had died. And then I was encouraged by an attorney I knew in Canada to file one um, as someone who has over decades witnessed the harm and the biases and so on. So we filed these um, ethics complaints, and there's a, I can send a, a, a sample one if anybody wants to see it. Um, and we asked for um, two kinds of things for each person. Um, they, and by the way, we documented these myths, and we said, you know, as, as we learned from Watergate to say, what did they know and when did they know it? The heads of the Psychiatric Association, the heads of the DSM task force, the, the members of the different DSM committees, um, when did they know that what they were doing wasn't scientific? And when did they know that what they did was harming people? And what did they do about it? And did they even speak publicly about this? To warn the public, to empower you to be an informed consumer. No, they absolutely did not. And in fact, they came out repeatedly with public announcements. It's wonderful how psychiatric diagnosis has become so scientific. Total lie. So anyway, we filed these complaints, and, and um, the, each person was asking for two kinds of things. One was to restore me to where I was before this happened. So one young woman had lost a scholarship because she had to drop out of school because of what was done to her. Um, and, and so what would restore me personally? And then the other um, was a set of things asking that would help other people in the future. So, for example, that the, that the APA should be required, just like the drug companies are supposed to keep a record of harm from their drugs and make it public, that the APA should have to do the same thing with, when people have written in about being harmed by getting a label. Um, anyway, there was a whole array of those kinds of things. And what happened was, the, we knew this would happen, um, but we did it anyway. We had 60 page complaints for each person. The uh, APA ethics department uh, dismissed all the complaints with not a word about the merits of the complaints. And they said, we're dismissing them on two grounds, two little paragraphs. And each ground held no water whatsoever. So I wrote back to them and I said, um, so this is why each of your grounds holds no water. And how do we uh, appeal? And they said there is no appeal. So what, and what happened also was we had asked in our complaints that because the complaints were against the psychiatric, American Psychiatric Association as a whole and the dsm IV task force as a whole and on and on, we said we think that you should bring in outsiders to evaluate these ethics complaints. And we showed how they feel, failed to meet their own ethical standards. Well, so I said, so who, who did the review? She wouldn't tell us. So um, then, um, as Wendy Murphy suggested, she said, now you go to the Office of Civil Rights of the Department of Health and Human Services. So five of the women filed complaints there. It was on somewhat different grounds. This was, we said, that the Americans with Disabilities Act 
has two basic provisions. One is um, you're discriminated against if you have some sort of disability and you're treated as though you don't. You're in a wheelchair and they won't provide a ramp. But the other is you don't have a disability, in this case a mental illness, but you're treated as though you do. Right? So we filed these five complaints. After months, they were dismissed with no attention to the merits. And again, on two very briefly described grounds, neither of which held water, both of which had been dispensed with in the complaints themselves. I wrote a letter pointing that out, asked what's the route for appeal. They said there is none. Now, no surprise, but what this proves, now we have a paper trail showing that not only is there no one regulating psychiatric diagnosis, but that the two entities, one a lobby group, the APA, the other a government entity, that should by all rights be the ones providing oversight and regulation and redress from harm, um, have absolutely no wish to take it on. So that's, that was a really important thing that, that we came out with. Um, just really quickly, I, I need to spend just a few minutes talking about what I called, uh, I wrote an article called Diagnosis Gate. Um, and I want to tell you about it because it involves psychiatric diagnosis and it is the most major um, conflict of interest um, uh, scandal in the history of the mental health system. And what happened was that Alan Francis, the king of diagnosis, one year after the DSM 4, his edition was published, he um, secretly uh, got together with two other psychiatrists. Uh, Alan had been at Duke, uh, one of the others was at Columbia, and one was at Cornell. So it's never people from universities or colleges you've never heard of. They're always these high status places, right? And um, so the three of them got together, and Alan, speaking for the other two, uh, there, there, is, there is correspondence that's been made public now, emails, between Alan Francis and um, a subsidiary of Johnson & Johnson Pharmaceuticals. These are the people who kept it a secret that baby powder caused um, uh, ovarian cancer. They knowingly kept that secret. Um, so they have a subsidiary called uh, Janssen Pharmaceuticals. And Janssen uh, had just gotten FDA approval for a new drug called Risperdal, which is classified as an antipsychotic. Now the so-called antipsychotic drugs don't tend to stop hallucinations and delusions. They just suppress the person's central nervous system so much that they don't talk about it anymore, so it doesn't bother anybody. And then it's assumed that, well, now they're fine right, because of, of this drug. So Risperdal had been approved by the FDA to treat schizophrenia, which again is a construct and there's not science behind it. Um, and, and what Alan Francis says to Janssen Pharmaceuticals is, here's what the three of us are going to do for you. We're going to write a practice guideline. You know, the practice guidelines are usually written by people in these professional associations and they say things like, you know, if this, if for the pediatricians, if this child has acid reflux, here's how you treat it, right? So Alan and his two colleagues were going to uh, write a practice guideline for treating schizophrenia. And he promised in advance, he said, we're going to do two things in this practice guideline. We're going to say that the atypical antipsychotics, this was a new kind of antipsychotic uh, drug um, that was different in some ways from the antipsychotic drugs that had been in use for some years. We're going to say, first of all, that the new class of drugs is more effective than the old one. There wasn't evidence for that. And we're going to say, and Risperdal is the one to use. And he said, if you'll pay us about half a million dollars and an extra 60000 if we do it fast. And Janssen Pharmaceuticals said, sure. And they did it. And they did it fast, so they got their bonus. And then Alan Francis wrote a letter. This is all from an expert witness report from one of the top ethicists in the country, Dr. David Rothman, who's at uh, Columbia. Columbia. Yeah. And um, so, so they said, uh, Alan said, OK, now here's what we're going to do. He said, the three of us have now constituted ourselves as EKS, expert knowledge 
systems. And we have a marketing plan for you. Now this is the king of psychiatric diagnosis, but he's talking about money and selling. So we have a marketing plan for you. It's going to be two-pronged. One is you uh, hire uh, people we're going to identify as, um, what's the word, uh, uh, knowledge, K, what's K-O-L, uh, anyway, they're, they're like respected in their field, right, psychiatrists. And you're going to pay them, and they're going to go around and hold continuing education classes. And the point of these classes was, is going to be use Risperdal. And some of the people that they brought on <clears throat> included a guy who had worked on the DSM-4, done some really horrible things, uh, and he was now head in Texas of the, um, the whole state mental health system. So he was in a position to order Risperdal for everybody. And the, the, the head of the prison system in Texas. There's a whole other thing I won't go into because of time about, about how George W. Bush was very involved in all of this. Um, Texas drug companies, his dad was on the board, pharmaceutical companies and so on. Uh, but anyway, so and the, the, the second prong of the marketing plan uh, was, was going to be, and here's what you need to do. You need to get a bunch of medical and psychiatric journal articles published, and of course they'll ghost write them for, for the doctors whose names are going to go on them, and they're going to be to recommend Risperdal for all kinds of things. Now it had still only been approved to treat schizophrenia. Um, you may have heard about the big scandal about the psychiatrist at Harvard who, uh, who was saying diagnosing kids right and left with bipolar disorder. Oh, childhood bipolar disorder, one of the great undiscovered problems, and getting them all on Risperdal. All right, this was, this was part of where this started, but it couldn't have happened without what, what these three psychiatrists did, the plan that they put in place. Well, these articles came out in, in medical and psychiatric journals recommending Risperdal for just about everything you can imagine. For autism, for distractibility in kids, for memory problems in old people. For, it just went on and on and on. Um, now, here, here's the, a really interesting thing, and I'm working with an investigative journalist on this because it's a mystery. We don't know why it's happened. When I was writing this Diagnosis Gate article, I, uh, it was, by the way, it was published in a, in a Canadian journal called Aporia, A-P-O-R-I-A, -A, a nursing journal. Um, uh, neither, neither scholarly journals here, nor uh, regular, like, uh, magazines and stuff for the general public, nobody, nobody would touch this, even though Dr. Rothman's report was right there, and I would send it to them. Um, and they would say, well, you can't attack this man. So I'm not attacking this man. I'm just writing about what happened. Um, but what I found was there were five or six major media stories about how states' attorneys general, in starting with the one in Texas, were filing suits against Jansen, Jansen Pharmaceuticals for false advertising and you know de deceptive consumer practices for hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars and a lot of states got involved and so it turned out this is the report that Dr. Rothman wrote was for one of these lawsuits well they all ended up settling out of court and when articles were written about these lawsuits and the fact that they had settled and how much they settled for they named a whole lot of the people who had been involved in the whole Risperdal scandal, and they never mentioned Alan Francis or his two colleagues, who had created the fundamental document without which none of this would have happened, the practice guideline, and then created the marketing plan. Um, and so the mystery is, why not? That Their names were so prominent in Dr. Rothman's report. Why were they not mentioned? I don't know. Um, and, and then I saw that Stephen Brill, who's one of the most respected investigative journalists in this country, was going to, to do a 15-day, 15-part series about the Risperdal scandal. 
And so I thought, this is going to be great. Now all this stuff will come out. Because my Diagnosis Gate article was published, but hardly anybody read it. And so they didn't know about it. And so I read, I read his first installment, second installment, and then I realized, oh, he's going in chronological order, and he's already gone past the involvement of Alan Francis and his two colleagues. And so I, I wrote him a message through Facebook, um, and I said, great that you're doing this, and I'm sure you already know, but just in case, and I sent him the link to the Diagnosis Gate article. He never mentioned it. I never heard back from him. And so the question is why? Why are these people being protected? And, and so we, we hope to come up with, um, with some answers in this article we're working on. All right, now let me, uh, let me just say, I want to hear from you all. Um, I, I have uh, 12 different kinds of actions that people can take from a very brief one, bless you, there are two um, petitions online having to do with this. Um, and uh, right through to uh, we, need, we need a lawsuit that will be a test case. Um, and Wendy Murphy said, don't ask for money because then those trials go on forever. She said, ask for what are called equitable remedies. So I said, well, we already have the description in the complaints. We will ask for the APA to keep a record of harm and so on and so on. But I still have to find a lawyer who will do this. I've got people who want to be the test case. Um, and so I, I won't go over these 12 different actions. If you want, I can tell you where you can find a description of them online. And let me just do one more thing from the, the, from the play, Call Me Crazy, and then we'll hear from you. Um, in the play, there, as I said, there are four therapists and four mental patients, and there's a ninth character, and she's wearing a, like early 1900s clothing, and she's just watching through the whole play, and she's not speaking, and nobody seems to see her. And, um, and about two-thirds of the way through the play, um, the song The Blue Danube starts to play, and she goes downstage, and this is what she says to the audience. Thank you for coming. I'm Amalia Freud, Amalia Nathanson Freud. I lived to be 95 years old. I wanted people to know that my son was the great psychoanalyst, winner of the Goethe Prize for Literature. But behind their polite smiles, I saw the thought, this is the mother whose son discovered that all little boys want to have sex with their mothers. Discovered. Huh. And about girls and their mothers, what did he discover? That our daughters resent us for not having had the courtesy to provide them with a penis. I had five daughters. How do you think his words made me feel? I love my Sigmund, but this is too much. He told people he felt all his life like a conqueror because he was my indisputable favorite. Ah, so he thought. The truth is I loved all my children. How could I not? Sigmund was my firstborn. I loved my daughters also, but kept on having to have more, five in all, until Jacob got one more son. Most of the time Sigmund was growing up, his father and all the other children and I shared three bedrooms, but Sigmund had his own. He needed to study. He complained that his sister Anna's piano lessons were noisy when he was trying to study. We got rid of the piano. Anna and I were sad, but not angry. We understood. Maybe he had too much. And he decided who was normal. You know, he threw up his hands in despair and said, What do women want? What's not to understand? Is it healthy to take a wife's love or a mother's love and make it seem so complicated? Normal, shmormal. Oh, I realized some people have to be put away. They can hurt themselves or someone else. But it's a tough problem. 
You start putting people away and somebody's going to decide who gets put away. Somebody's going to choose the rules. And somehow, I wonder, is what these therapists decide today any better than what my son decided? Thinking about it makes my head hurt. But I tell you what I have noticed. Who decides is who has the power. And somehow, they seem to decide the people the most like them are the normal ones. It's the good, the healthy, the deserving. It's the others who are derided, called dangerous, sent away. My five daughters, one went to New York, three were gassed at Auschwitz, and the last one starved to death in the camp at Theresienstadt. Hmm? Thank you for listening. And then the Blue Danny plays and she walks off. So, over to you. Thank you. Let's open it up for <coughs> comments, questions. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I'm thinking about uh, in terms of the way that the story we tell ourselves and different things that disorders create sort of this narrative about this is the permanence and the thing that I am, so then you sort of manifest it in yourself. Yes. Which, you know, a lot of writers and uh, structuralism and post-structuralism some of the stuff you don't know if you've read Foucault at all, and some of his ideas and meditation on this. But um, one of the things I'm thinking about a lot, um, I guess, as someone that has been like, medicalized and you know um, struggled in my life, is also like in the way that we've like reappropriated the, the word queer, and like I'm also a queer person, and I'm like, proud of it, and I use that word. Mm -hmm. Like the ways in which like disorder we've like also like articulated it as necessarily a bad, like, like even a bad thing um, itself. Like so how, like, sorry. So I guess my, my question is like, for instance, like for a long time I started using, you know, cause I was like different in school and I like, found ways to, to work through it um, and use, use labels like ADHD like proudly, but maybe mm -hmm. not other ones. Some people, you know, have appropriated ADHD and use it in a certain way. A lot of people do. And like, but I found that like, you know, I am disordered. I do like, you know, I've changed careers five times, but I've also like, by having, by learning how like my disorder is also a gift, I can like see how we're all different rather than we're all normal. Mm -hmm. You know, so like, for me it's also like, it's been kind of an act of like becoming, so like, I'm sort of trying to, like, not, you know, oh, I'm, no, I'm actually normal. It's like, no, I am different. And we're all different. But, like, and I go through these states, and sometimes I'm in, like, this, you know, state of, you know, manic hyper-focus, and I'll come up with all these ideas, or I'll get up on stage and, you know, give an impassioned speech, and um, I do some, like, community organizing in Worcester, and it's like, uh -huh. I kind of dissociate a little bit. I don't even remember what happened, and people tell me it was really good. You're in a zone. In the right? zone, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, yeah, could you? Say, you know, don't say dissociate, say you're in a zone, well, I don't know. right? I don't care about it. I don't <laughs> no, it's not what you th yeah. think of it, yeah. it's what other people think. Yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so that was like the thing is like, I don't know. And, uh, yeah, I have other friends with like, I don't know, they had that been diagnosed with schizophrenia, and they're also like, also geniuses. And like, I don't know, like, I recently tried, I'm trying to form this peer support group recently anti-psychiatry peer support, but also, like, um, I know you, you talked a lot about, a lot of religions have had kind of more indoctrinating, but, like, when you look at certain tribal societies, the way that they treat people with, like, you know, that label schizophrenia is, like, far better, and they, like, allow them to see that they have gifts. So, like, um, transpersonal psychology, I think, it can be useful if you're familiar with that field. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, I don't know, these are all ideas that I'm coming up with, like, how to, like, you know, like, could be like 
use labels in a different way to, to not say that it was a permanent thing you have, but these are like, you know, can we shift and say like, yeah, you're different in this way, but it's good. Yes. I love that. I think you're doing extremely important work. So let me, let me just suggest, um, I, I, I understand, and often I support the concept of reclaiming words that have been used against you, yeah. but it's one thing to reclaim a word like queer, um, because that's, a dis that's assumed to be a description of sexual orientation, right? But if you try to reclaim ADHD or bipolar disorder, that's not so specific. And it's what other people will do with that. And Audre Lorde, one of my favorite quotations in the world, she said, we cannot use the master's tools to dismantle the master's house. These are the master's tools. And so if we could say, um, gee, when you say you have whatever you know, label or labels you have, we want the whole world, here's what we want you to think when you hear that, rather than what you think now. That would be great, but that's not how it works. And so, um, uh, what, to, to, to say, I loved, I loved what you said about um, people saying that they're, they have a disorder, and then you say, well, we try and show them it's also a gift. I would just want to take that one step farther and say, well, you don't have a disorder, you are part of the variability of the human species, right? Uh, because if I say, uh, you have a disorder but also a gift, but he has a gift, mm -hmm. that's making you a second-class citizen. Yeah. It's, a, it's an us and them. And I think that's dangerous. And that, and one of the things um, that bothers me about using these terms that don't have any science or much specificity behind them is that it prevents us from connecting with each other. So you know, I remember I read a study, and and I wish I, I wish I had the reference. Maybe you do. Um, that before Massachusetts um, said gay marriage was legal. Um, X number, X percentage of people in Massachusetts were opposed to it. And one year after the law changed, they, they did the same study. It was a 20% shift. Yeah, yeah, they declined. And I remember this one guy that, that had this great thick Boston accent was interviewed on the radio and he said, well, you know, he said, I, he said my, uh, I, uh, I have breakfast with my wife, and then I, I open the front door, and I'm in my bathrobe, and I pick up my newspaper. Oh, remember newspapers. Anyway, yeah. and he says, and there's this guy next door. He has a husband, and he's out there in his bathrobe picking up his newspaper. So it's seeing that kind of commonality that connects people. And so if you say you have bipolar disorder, you are telling me um, that's more important, that difference between us is more important than that I have times when I get just driven to do something, you know, or, or whatever. And, and, um, and so it's, it's the inter interruption of the, the human connections uh, that's part of what worries me in addition to the fact that you know, as soon as you accept a label, you, you, you are exposed to all kinds of harm. And it's so hard to get them taken out of your file once you have them. Um, I want to mention one other thing that, that was just beautifully, beautifully effective. Um, you may have heard of uh, something called the Hearing Voices Network. Um, and they're, they're wonderful. Because what do we do with somebody who says, well, I'm the Virgin Mary, or somebody told me to do such. We, we tend to say as a society, uh-oh, that's bad. We have to stop that because that's not good for you. So you're told you're bad, you're told you're wrong, you're going to have to change. And you've got enough trouble if what the voices are telling you are upsetting or if people have made fun of you when you talk about the voices that you hear. Hearing voices, <laughs> what they do is they, they bring people together who all say they hear voices. And they say, they never say you're wrong, they never say we're here to stop it. They say, so um, what do your voices say to you? And does it sound like anybody that you recognize? 
And what do they tell you? And what do you feel when they tell Some of them are perfectly harmless in every conceivable sense of the word. And others aren't. They're scary to the person, or they are sometimes hearing they're supposed to do harm to somebody else. But when we pathologize them and tell them they're bad and they're wrong, it makes them worse. They feel even more different. It's a, it's a difference amplifying effect. You know, they start out somewhat different, and then we treat them as though they're very different, and then they become even more different. And then they're going to get a second label and a third and more drugs and so on. Um, but so with the, the, the people who really are troubled by the voices or they are dangerous to somebody else, maybe because of them, uh, they, they get suggestions from other people in the group. So what do you do when the voices are making you feel like you're nothing? Or what do you do when they say, go strangle somebody? And it's wonderful. It's so powerful and it's so effective. And it's the opposite of the, the demeaning and pathologizing labeling. So that's any help. Yes. Oh, hi. Hi. Um, I work at the Schlesinger Library, and I just wanted to let everyone know that we have Dr. Kaplan's oh. papers at the Schlesinger Library, which we're so proud to have. And, um, thank you. What's your name? Amanda Strauss. Hi. Oh, Maryland. You're, okay. Yes, hi. Nice hi. Thank um, you for coming. And I was just actually sort of struck when I was thinking about what you were talking about right now, and I was thinking about Barbara Siemens work in Women's oh. Case Against the Pill, and so it's just sort yeah. of an interesting way of yes. um, you know pushing against things that are sort of commonly held doctrines. So uh, thank you yes. for your talk, and everybody that we thank do you. have these uh, wonderful resources at the Schlesinger Library. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Uh, Barbara, Barbara Seaman was a brave feminist who, who really sounded the warning about the pill. She wrote a book called The Women, the Doctors, the Doctors' Case Against the Pill, or the Women's Case Against well, the Pill. Anyway, yeah, <laughs> the, the Women's Case Against the Pill. Yeah, it was it was really great. It was based on. The science, based on you know what had been found, she her was. Her papers are also in the library. So pardon, yeah. her papers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's the Sussinger Library. If you don't know about it, is a great resource. Part part of Radcliffe. Thank you. The premier American library in the history of women. That's, That's right. right. That's, That's right. right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Hi. Uh, Hi. I, I'm Jeran. Uh, I'm a psychiatry resident. Oh and yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I also agree with you about uh, labeling people and uh, the risk of harm by diagnosis and treatment. Mm -hmm. But I find difficult to position myself about the diagnosis and treatment when I see a patient, especially in the emergency room, and there is a risk of harm to themselves to, or other people for suicide, homicide, mm -hmm. these kind of uh, issues. So there are, there's another field of uh, forced treatment and ethics about it, but we see sometimes patients, people suffering, mm -hmm. and uh, they can commit suicide because of the delusions, or it yeah. can be hallucinations, or hearing voices, or they can be a manic state. Uh, we found a mother uh, with a dead baby. Uh, mm -hmm. She was wandering around for days and the police brought her. So these can be like the extreme conditions, not mm -hmm. that everyone is mm -hmm. uh, going to have these things, but how uh, do you see these uh, situations? That's, thank you very much, because um, those, those are so scary. And, and um, the, the problem is when you've, when you've got a short period of time and there's real potential danger there, um, then it's really easy to say, let's get them diagnosed, locked up, medicated. And part of the problem is that if we're not training therapists to think about what else might we do, then there, you don't have any other option. You have to you have to do what you've been taught will protect them or society. Um, you have to protect yourself from lawsuits and the hospital or you know the clinic or whatever it is. Um, but what we need is more education of mental health professionals about what really is helpful. Now we know if you lock people up, um, the the uh, rates of suicide committed by people shortly after they've been released from a mental hospital go up. Now, why is that? 
Um, often it's because their medication dose has been changed just before they're released and suicides increase when you go on psychiatric drugs, when you go off them, or when your dose is changed either higher or lower than it was before. And so often the dose is changed in one, you know, in one direction or another before the person leaves. Um, often these drugs, just even if you have been on it and the dose hasn't been changed, they've been proven to increase suicide. So I just think it's this huge tragedy and irony that we say, oh, they're suicidal, put them on drugs. Because we know that there's a serious chance that that will increase their violent behavior against others or against themselves. Um, what? Um, and let me let me give another example that's related to this. Um, there was a, a, a film that won the Oscar for a documentary short a few years ago, and it was about the VA suicide hotline. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you all saw that film. I found it chilling because it, it, they didn't show any of the people who were calling in. They said it was for, to protect their privacy. But you could tell what they were saying because of the way the responders were talking. And there was only one person, one time in a 40-minute film that you heard saying anything warm or connecting to the person who was feeling like killing themselves. All of the rest was about either Okay, now stay right there, give me the address, we, we're going to get the police to you, right? Not how awful for you, not I want to talk to you, call me in an hour, how can I reach you? Not I will follow through with you, I will talk to you tomorrow, I'll talk to you next week. Not I will put you in touch with other people who will be supportive. Not how are you isolated, not, and, and one woman... And I, all these people, I'm sure, meant well. And, and it said in the film, they had all had some mental health training. Well, one woman is talking to this guy and she says, uh-huh, so you're a Marine, uh-huh, and you've got two kids, uh-huh. And, you're, and, you're, and she's saying it about like this. And you're, you're seeing your dead buddy floating in a pool of his blood, uh-huh, uh-huh. Don't you know your children need their marine father? This is what she was telling him in order to try to keep him from killing himself. Now, the first thing you should learn about people who are suicidal is they think they're going to protect their children by killing themselves. They think their children are suffering because they're such awful people. And, and I, I, just, I just was horrified. Um, and then if you look at the statistics, if you look at the VA's own reports, they're very vague about how many people are their suicide hotlines saving. Um, in contrast, the National Veterans Foundation, which was founded by uh, a Vietnam vet named Shad Mishad, and he's, he's out in LA now, um, they have a phone line they get calls from Afghanistan, they get calls from all over the place. And when somebody says they're suicidal, they do the opposite of what the VA does. And that's what works. Um, so, part of, part of the problem of the situation you have, I understand, is that we don't have the kind of society we need to have. We should be able to say, instead of locking her up, instead of medicating her, Let's, let's put her in a community of people who, like in other kinds of societies, will care for her, will not say you're bad, you're wrong, but will say you must be terrified. What can we do to help you? Um, Susan Stefan, S-T-E-F-A-N, is a brilliant lawyer who has written about so many subjects. She's written great stuff about sexual assault. She has written a book that is about suicide. And one of the things she did was to go through systematically all the studies and showed that what happens in the mental health system doesn't reduce suicides. At the VA, in the military, they've been trying, you know, the kitchen sink, but they haven't tried connecting with people in a meaningful way and in an ongoing way. 
Um, and Susan Stefan says what has been found to be helpful is forming these connections, maintaining them, and not saying you shouldn't do this, but saying what would make your life worth living? And is there a way I can help you with that? Now that that doesn't sound medical. It doesn't sound... Can I add something to that? Because yeah. there's I have a student of mine here who was a, a, a multi, multi-tour, mm. um, I believe Marine, uh, served multiple tours in Afghanistan and Iraq, and um, he started an organization here of, it's called One Summit, which is an organization where veterans who are struggling in all sorts of ways, who are yeah. suffering from being multiple, serving multiple tours in war zones, um, mentor kids who have physical kinds of challenges and um. they do all sorts of like athletic stuff and, and rock climbing and these kinds of things and it, it's called One Summit and it's it's meant to that we all are sort of searching for the summit together yeah, and it's yeah. it's actually one of one vis- part of the vision is an attempt to, to depathologize people who are diagnosed or might be diagnosed with PTSD and mm-hmm. put them in communities where there's a sort of purpose to the relationships that they build yes. with different people, with each other as veterans and also younger generations of kids. Um, and it's, it's, I've, I've been to some of their events and, and, and it's precisely this kind of a thing to, to create communities yeah. that, so that they're not engaged in a kind of patholog- or pathologizing relationship with the VA, uh-huh. which they've been very frustrated with. So. Anyway, well, that's beautiful, that's an and that. that's beautiful. And and what I found in a dozen years of working with veterans, and this this applies to anybody who's suffering in, in, in such an extreme way as the people you see, is that there are the, you know they've been traumatized, right? And trauma is fragmenting, and it often isolates you, just as Tim was talking about. And so, what? When I hear from vets what does help you come off the brink, you know, is there, there are two kinds of themes, and either or both is what has helped them. And one is connection. Mm-hmm. And for some, it's something meaningful like this. Relationships. Meaningful relationships. Meaningful some, relationships. For some, it's with music or with something spiritual, Art. right? And the other is creating. All right, now for vets, they've all been trained to defend, attack, and kill. So then when they come back, they're supposed to be different all of a sudden and get rid of all of that training, and which was done with at the risk of life or death situations. And, and nobody helps them. There's no system in place to help them make that transition. But, but creating, whether it's writing a play, whether it's um, tutoring a young kid, who needs help or, or whatever, when they are creating something, that's the opposite of defend, attack, and kill. And the other, the other aspect is that when your identity is, you, if, like if this woman was, she, if she thought she was a bad mother or if she thought she and her baby were in danger so she had to keep walking or whatever it is, you, you need to help the person change their sense of identity of who they are. And so when you are somebody who is, has found meaning in creating something, in making a connection, in, in helping somebody with a uh, physical disability, for example, or helping your community, um, that's the kind of thing that's really healing. But believe me, I feel for you because you're in such a difficult situation. One small thing I might mention, um, I, after, after They Say You're Crazy came out, and I was thinking, I had this image of the, Ameri- the, the DSM people would have us believe that if you imagine the, the enterprise of psychiatric diagnosis as a sphere, they want us to believe it's filled with solid science. Well, we know that's not true. You take all that out, it creates a vacuum. What goes into a vacuum when there's no science and objectivity? Every conceivable kind of bias. So that's why in the mental health system, um, women in general are treated worse than men, um, people of color are treated worse than white people, poor people are treated worse than old people are treated worse and on and on and on. Okay, so I edited a book called Bias in Psychiatric Diagnosis that documents all these kinds of isms uh, in the process of applying and, and then acting upon these labels. And one of the things that I wrote in the introduction is if you're going to give somebody a label, then, and I know it's 
harder when you're in the ER and you're rushed and, and, and so much is at stake. But if you, insofar as you can, talk to the person about, I'm going to give you a label because otherwise they'll make you leave and you won't get help. Um, explain to them what label you're giving them and why. And then say, here's what I'm going to write in your chart right where it says what the diagnosis is. And then you write a sentence, <coughs> something like, the fact that this person has been given this label should not be interpreted as reflecting in any way on their ability to be a good employee, a good member of the community, a good parent. And if anyone has any questions about this in the future, please contact me. I mean, it's, it's a little thing to do, but whoever does it, whoever talks about, about doing it. Oh, we have time, yes. you know, time for maybe one or two more questions. Yes. And yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry, I missed your presentation because I was in another session. Yes. Uh, but I have a strong interest in this uh, issue. Um, your uh, reference of excessive use of drugs in treating mm -hmm. psych psychiatric disease, and it's not only specific to psychiatry, right. it's in all fields of medicine. Right. Today, almost in all countries, medical education is dominated or controlled by pharmaceutical industry. That's right. So that's the biggest problem yep. in all fields. And that's why the, the prevention is not there, mm -hmm. and everything is right. based on treatment, right. treatment with drugs. Right. So it, I think this requires a, maybe bigger attention at the policy level Yes. to change the medical education that we are giving to our doctors in all fields, not only in psychiatry. Of course, psychiatry has specific issues attached to it. Mm -hmm. mm, I'm not sure if there's anything in the U.S. about this talk well, of using prevention techniques as an important part of uh, medical education, because I'm sure doctors are not aware of what the nutrition affect our body, and they don't advise uh, using quality nutrition right. to start with. But they just right. write the medicine and just use them and you will get better and until you get the next disease. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, a couple things about that. One, one is that when I went on Medicare, um, now all of a sudden my doctor periodically asked me certain questions. Are you smoking? Are you drinking? You know, and let's, let's do this preventive stuff. But not not about not about uh, emotional things, and um, and certainly medical education is just terrible with respect to um, being controlled so much by big pharma. And there's a book I cannot recommend highly enough by Robert Whitaker, who lives right near here. Um, it's W I W H I T A K E R. And um, first he wrote a book called Mad in America, which is wonderful. And he now has a website that's full of all sorts of great articles and comes out periodically um, called Mad in America. But his, his most recent, no, his, his previous book um, before the most recent one is called Anatomy of an Epidemic. And what he did, he, he's an investigative journalist and he was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize. And what he did was he took very middle-of-the-road entities, um, the World Health Organization and the National Institute of Mental Health. These are not fringe groups. He looked at their own data, and he, he looked at what their data showed with regard to time one for psychiatric drugs being before each class of drugs went on the market. So he had the so-called antidepressants, the so-called anti-anxiety drugs, and the so-called antipsychotics. So time one for each group was before this class of drugs went on the market. And time two was now. And he looked at two kinds of things. One was, what was the rate of recovery before the drugs and now? And the rates of recovery for all three classes have plummeted. And the other question he looked at was, what has been the rate at which people taking each kind of drug, go on long-term disability. And those have skyrocketed. And it's very powerful. He also explains, well, he quotes Stephen Hyman, who was uh, the provost of Harvard and who used to head the National Institute of Mental Health, 
talking about what is the problem with these drugs. Because what Whitaker concludes, based on the data, is every one of these drugs helps some people sometimes at least for a while. Although there's a new study out, it's very important, shows anybody who's been on one of the so-called antidepressants, even for a brief time once, is more likely than people who've never been on it to experience these feelings of despair and helplessness and hopelessness. Um, so that's really scary. But, but he, uh, so he, he says vastly more often they harm than help. Well, that's the reason that I was saying before you came, why we need full disclosure. How can I make a decision about whether I'm going to take, whether it's a statin or whether it's a so-called antidepressant, if I don't know the facts? Uh, you know, I might say, well, I realize I'm more likely to be harmed than helped, but I'm feeling so awful, I'll take the chance. Uh, but also, if, if the person says to me, yeah, but you know, um, taking a drama class has helped so many people who are feeling like this, you might want to do that, or joining a choir, or having a service animal. So we're not, we're not giving these, given these options. But what, what uh, Whitaker quotes Stephen Hyman is saying is the following. And uh, let me preface it by saying the when you think that psychiatric labeling is a science, then it's very easy to pair that with and so anybody who has an emotional or behavioral problem has a defective brain. And that's how the drug companies do their advertising. And people will say, I know my, there's something wrong with my brain. I just know it because, you know, that's, otherwise I wouldn't be feeling like this or acting like that. And they say this drug helps. All right. But, but what's, what Stephen Hyman says is, here's how these drugs work and here's why they cause so much harm. First of all, the studies that the FDA requires pharma to do before approving a drug. Um, I, I wrote an article with a, a former undergraduate of mine that was in New Scientist. You could drive, any 12-year-old any could drive a truck through the methodology. They, they, you hardly have to have people on the drug for more than six weeks. Um, you, you exclude people from the trials. People will drop out because the drugs make them feel so bad and you don't include them in your analysis. So instead of saying, well, 40% of people dropped out and, and it, you know, so 10% of the original sample were helped, you say, well, you know, 40% of the original sample were helped. It, it's, it's really scandalous. But here's what happens in the brain. Um, let's say, let's use, you know, everybody says, oh, serotonin, if it's low, you get depressed. That's not true. There's not a shred of evidence of that. And the American Psychiatric Association has acknowledged that. And psychiatrists in the New York Times have said they know there's no evidence of that. They actually said, but we're not going to tell our patients. I, I wrote a thing about this. Anyway, so, but here's, here's what happens. Let's pretend serotonin makes you feel happier if it's higher. So you have a certain amount of this in your brain in your, you know, circulating. And there are serotonin receptors in your brain. Now, if you take Prozac, it supposedly fools your, your brain into thinking that you have more serotonin than you really have. And so what happens is you start taking it, and a lot of people will say, I feel so much better on it. Well, that's because it raises something. It's not serotonin, because that's not what does it, but it, these drugs, by the way, if you, if you want to market your drug for depression, you, you don't necessarily study, in fact, they don't, the drug companies don't study the various systems it affects and the various chemicals it affects. And so mostly this is experimental treatment, even though these drugs are approved by the FDA because the methodology is so bad. But anyway, so what happens is, so you have this much serotonin, and you take the drug, and your, your brain is fooled into thinking, oh, now I have more. So you feel better. But then what happens is your body, there are feedback loops. So, you, so your brain says, oh, she's ingesting something that raises my level. I don't have to make as much anymore or hold on to as much. It starts killing off some of the serotonin receptors in your brain. So then, that's why a lot of people say, well, I felt better at first. And then the you know, therapist will often say, I'm going to put you on this drug. 
uh, but we may need to raise your dose. But they won't tell you why, right? Um, and, and so you, you keep taking more and more and more. Now, if you decide to go off it, um, and, oh, and because there's a feedback loop, every drug, whatever it's marketed as doing, it also does the opposite. And so people who go on the antidepressants, many will become more depressed, or they'll feel better for a while, then they get more depressed than they ever were, whatever, however you define depression. And <clears throat> so what happens is if you decide to go off a drug, then if you stop taking it, you don't have as many receptors as you used to have. You're going to feel terrible. And too often you go back to the person who prescribed the drug and they say, oh, you're even sicker than we thought. And in fact, I don't think you have major depressive disorder. I think you have bipolar 1 disorder. We better get you on a stronger drug or get you back on the drug you were on, but increase the dose. They don't say, these are withdrawal symptoms that anybody who never had a problem who went on this drug, if, they took, if you took them off, they'd have these now. And so what happens is, for any individual, your receptors may, you, your, your may start producing more of the receptors, because your brain thinks we need them again, but there's no way of knowing for any individual how fast that will happen, how far it will go, how effective it will be. So there's abs this is so much of this is experimental. Um, I'm yes. afraid we're going to have to cut it short, yeah. only because okay. we, this room, we got to be out of this room by two. Yeah. Um, but I'm, I'm, I know there are a couple of other folks who wanted to ask questions, so if you wanted I to, can stay to stay, maybe while, yeah. just up in here until someone <laughs> throws yes. us out or whatever. Or we can both yeah, yeah, or just right outside, that'd be great. Sure. Thanks everybody for coming, we really Thank appreciate you so much, it. Jay, yeah, yeah. Can you hit the. Yeah. Oh. Thank, oh, can I just ask? Anybody who asked a question who doesn't want the, oh, right. to be online um, in the link, can, can you let me know? Yeah, we can. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Yes, you can. All right. All right.